I want to welcome everyone this evening to the uh, City Council meeting for November 28th. Hope everybody had a good Thanksgiving. The first item up is the public forum. The public forum is an opportunity for individuals to speak to the City Council on any city-related issues except for those items which have already been heard by a hearings official or are on tonight's agenda as a public hearing. <coughs> Each person will have three minutes to speak. When you come to the podium, please give your name, city of residence, and for Eugene residence, your ward if you know it. The time and lights indicate the time you have to speak. A yellow light will come on when you have 15 seconds to complete your comments. The red light indicates uh, that your time's up. And we are going to, um, we have uh, 14 people signed up. We'll start out with Michael Kerrigan, followed by Gene Stacy. Hello, my name is Michael Kerrigan. I live at 1439 West 4th Ave, and I'm a proud resident of Ward 7. <laughs> I work for Community Alliance of Lane County, and I'm here tonight to briefly tell you why Calc strongly supports the City Council extending the Occupy Eugene's exemption to the no camping ordinance so Occupy Eugene can stay longer at the Washington Jefferson Park. Occupy Eugene has been doing a lot to help the unhoused community here in Eugene. The permitted kitchen has been serving hundreds of meals each day. Along with the city, uh, Occupy Eugene has worked to protect pedestrians by putting up a perimeter fence around the camp uh, and is constantly upgrading the, the security there. The medical tent is staffed 24 hours a day has probably saved lives on two occasions by quickly responding to medical emergencies. Lives that may not have been saved uh, if, if these folks had, had been camping alone somewhere else. Each night a large number of outhouse folks are provided a safe place to camp. I could go on, but the important point is that Occupy Eugene is making progress dealing with homeless issues that will help the city, St. Finney's and others come up with a long-term plan to effectively deal with these issues. The city and Occupy Eugene have established a cooperative relationship that's a model for the rest of the country. I urge you to let this cooperative undertaking continue by extending the no camping, uh, the, no, the exemption uh, to the no camping ordinance <laughs> to go beyond the De December 15 expiration date. Thank you. Gene Stacy is next, followed by Joe Tendall. Good evening. I'm Gene Stacy, and I live at 944 West 12th Alley. I know you have concerns about the security, safety, and health issues at the camp, as do your constituents, and I want to update you on these very serious issues. Obviously, bringing together several hundred people who have been living on the streets for years or months without access to shelter, adequate food, or medical care meant we were initially overrun with problems. It's been an enormous struggle to first understand and then to rise to meet the overwhelming and immediate needs of those who arrived in our camp. With the help of numerous agencies, including Whitebird, Cahoots, and the EPD, to name only a few, and with the assistance of our on-site volunteer doctors, nurses, paramedics, and mental health volunteers, and with the incredibly generous support of medical supplies, shelter, clothing, food, from Eugenians, we are able to provide an impressive level of mental and health, uh, physical health care. I'm certain the young man who nearly died of an overdose, as Michael said, would have died had he not been in the camp. The issues brought to us by addiction and by the violence that's necessary for survival on the streets have been, by their nature, more difficult to resolve. Toward that end, the safety steering cluster has recently approved by consensus a new neighborhood agreement which is basically a social contract between all the members who live or work at the encampment. Each person on site will sign the agreements as condition of staying and receiving food and services. In signing, we each agree to make our community be free of weapons, illegal drugs, and alcohol, to resolve conflict nonviolently, and to treat each other with respect. And as part of this social contract, we agree to leave the camp if we fail to keep our commitments. Those who refuse to leave are encouraged to do so using nonviolent communication and techniques. All of our peacekeepers and many campers are being trained by professionals in de-escalation techniques. 
When there is no alternative to violence, the EPD has been very responsive and effective in helping us. We are rather rapidly developing a culture that is sufficiently safe that the violence that is so essential on the streets is no longer necessary or tolerated. We obviously don't have an instant solution to the drug problems of our society and the streets. There are numerous reports, however, of people who have gone into detox and who come to GAs and announce 60 days or 30 days of sobriety. We have an absolutely zero tolerance for drug paraphernalia. I will send each of you this report, and you can use the return email Thank you. for any further questions. Thank you. Joe Tendles next, followed by Bob Bussell. Okay. Council members, uh, Mayor Piercy, my name is Joe Tyndall. I live on West Broadway. In the 1960s, we the people reduced the oppression of blacks, cut back environmental pollution, and ended our occupation in Vietnam. To a degree, the uber-rich lost control of the society. But on August 23, 1971, the Powell letter signaled the counterattack. Billions began flowing to corporate think tanks to create a greed-is-good mythology to be amped by the corporate media. For 40 years, this gospel has justified concentration of wealth. Now, 400 people on the Forbes 400 list hold more wealth than the bottom 230 million Americans. But Occupy Wall Street has put a dent into despair as we have watched the systematic looting of our economy. Occupy Eugene is a symbol that enough is enough. But Occupy Eugene is also a homeless camp. We have inherited this problem, and we accept the challenge. Ninety percent of the camp is street kids and the homeless, the very people most impacted by the corporate cult of greed. Homelessness increased dramatically when the Reagan administration defunded much of the social safety net um, for the simple reason that rich people do not yet have enough money. Yes, many of the people at Occupy Eugene are there for free meals, public toilets, and protection from the police. The standard response to homelessness has, been pun homelessness has been punishment. Beat them up, take their stuff, and hopefully they will go somewhere else to die. Occupy Eugene believes we can do better. By simply showing respect, progress has been made. Almost daily, someone will announce at our General Assembly that they have 30 days of sobriety. Street kids now participate in peacekeeping. I watched personally as a peacekeeper in the food line was sucker punched for having broken up a fight earlier. She did not retaliate. Why? Because she was learning to deal with conflict, conflict nonviolently. So rather than the vendetta escalating, a group was convened to let the perpetrator know that if they wished to stay, violence would not be tolerated. Change is slow, but it is miracles like this that caused me to go on the site to help. This is why the city should not only continue the Occupy site, but support it as so many of the community have with their donations of food, supplies, cash, and their time. Thank you. Bob Bussell is next, followed by Carla Newbury. Mayor Piercy and members of the City Council, my name is Bob Bussell. I live at 3054 Grand Cayman Drive in Eugene. I wanted to make a few points about the proposed Bas Bascom Village development. I live in the Gillam area and I strongly support this project. First, I wanted to say that I think there really is a need for affordable housing, and this was underscored for me by several things I read recently. We got the news in the Register Guard not so long ago that there are going to be some new jobs created at Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines. That's the good news. It's a little less good news, though, that those jobs will pay $10 an hour. On $10 an hour, it's pretty hard to get affordable housing on that kind of wage. Recently, a new report by a group called Wider Opportunities for Women uh, reported that 45 percent of all U.S. residents lack what they call economic security. That is, they live above the federal poverty threshold but don't earn enough to cover basic necessities, including housing. I don't know the exact figures for Eugene, but I suspect that this figure illustrates the extent of the problem, especially in the down economy. I should also just add on the way over here in the parking lot of Cafe Yum, a woman came up to me and said, don't be afraid, but uh, my family and I are living out of a van, and can you help me in, in some way? And I think this is just a story that we're all familiar with, and for me, again, it affirms the need for affordable housing and our obligation to provide it to hardworking members of our community. 
Second point uh, is about the concerns that have been expressed by some opponents of the project regarding overcrowding in the schools. I share these concerns. I have a daughter at Cal Young Middle School, and she doesn't have any class, maybe one class actually, that has fewer than 30 or 35 students. But the source of the problem in our schools is not new housing, but rather inadequate funding that's caused layoffs and furlough days for school personnel. So we really, if we're concerned about our schools, need to direct our attention to Salem, where those decisions are made. And also note that when we had a chance in this community to restore funding via a tax measure, we failed to do so. Also, I just want to pose this question. What if a new company came onto Chad Drive and opened up and there were lots of new workers there. Would we say that we didn't want those kids coming to our schools, that we couldn't handle them? I don't think so. Finally, I want to just acknowledge there are legitimate concerns about certain aspects of Bascom Village. However, the wrong project, wrong place slogan I saw when I walked through my neighborhood this morning seems to reflect a sentiment of not in my backyard, and I wonder if the reaction would be the same if this were not an affordable housing project. I think we can find ways to address the concerns that have been expressed and make this project something that shows solidarity with those who struggle to make ends meet and reflects our best values as a community. And I simply want to say that I, along with some others in our neighborhood, we like to call ourselves Yimbies. Yes, in my backyard. We believe that our neighborhood and our community will be enriched and strengthened by this project, and I urge you to support it. Thank you. Carla Newbert, followed by Mark Callahan. Hello, counselors and mayor. My name is Carla Newbury. I reside at 544 West 16th, but I'm occupying Eugene. Some of you may remember me here from the Eugene Police Commission. I served with some of my fellow, my fellow counselor, fellow commissioners, who are also city councilors today, uh, Councilor Ortiz, Councilor Taylor, and Councilor Poling may remember me. You know, in, in the world, I'm a social worker. Uh, I'm a therapist, a crisis intervention counselor, a de-escalation trainer. Um, I'm theoretically retired. I worked on CAHOOTS for nine years and for uh, Lane County Mental Health for five. Uh, at the Occupy Village, I serve on the mental health support, research, and peacekeeping committees, and I teach de-escalation skills to whoever wants to learn them. But I am more than my skills, and I am not at the Occupy to bring my professional skills to help out in some paternalistic manner those less fortunate than I, because that's not how I see it. I am there because I believe, heart and soul, in the Occupy movement. Every person there is my peer. Every person is my teacher. Every hour I spend with my fellow Occupiers is another hour in which I grow, deepen, and expand. The transformative phenomenon of being in a developing culture, a culture based on inclusion, respect, and mutual empowerment is difficult to convey in words to one who has not experienced it firsthand. I would invite you all to come down to the Occupy site, to stop in on committee meetings on site or off site, to stop at the General Assembly, to watch the General Assembly online, find out what we're all about, and please extend the waiver. Thank you. Mark Callahan is next, followed by Doug Cooley. I think this came off the mic. Good evening, members of the City Council. My name is Mark Callahan. I live in North Eugene in Councilor Polling's ward. I'm here tonight to talk about the hypocrisy of the Occupy movements nationwide. A couple weeks ago, several speakers that gave public comment against the corporate greed and corporate personhood. They claim that corporations are evil and that corporations have too much influence in our political process. The hypocrisy of the various Occupy movements nationwide, including the Occupy Eugene Group here locally, comes when they are organizing and coordinating their efforts on the Facebook and Twitter corporate product sites of their supposed movement on their iPods, iPhones, laptops, and Blackberries made by corporations named Apple and Research in Motion with others nationwide while camping in their tents made by such corporations as Coleman or bought from stores and corporations like Walmart or REI. As they sit in their tents sleeping in their sleeping bags made by corporations like North Face in Columbia, sipping on their coffee and hot chocolate from corporations like Starbucks and Swiss Miss, they plan their strategy while occasionally using a portable toilet provided by the Bucks Corporation. Media stars like Michael Moore, who owns corporations, 
claim to support the Occupy movement cause, yet they also state that he is, he also states that he is part of the 1%, the 99% rail against, that make millions of dollars on the movies that he produces. I recently learned that there was an Occupy group that opened a bank account at a Wells Fargo. One of the supposed greedy corporations that the Occupy movements rail against in order to deposit $20,000 to continue to fund their movement. At the recent bank transfer day, 650,000 accounts were transferred nationwide from big banks to credit unions by the Occupy movement members. What the Occupy movement members don't realize is that they are actually helping the big banks by transferring their accounts, thereby reducing the deposits that the big banks have, thus reducing the amount of the FDIC insurance premiums the banks have to pay to the government, which is calculated by the amount of the deposits in the banks. Something to think about from the 53% that actually pay taxes. Thank you. Next is Doug Cooley, followed by Kevin Reed. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. My name is Doug Cooley. I work for Comcast and uh, reside in Salem, Oregon. I thought I'd take a few minutes this evening and just let the Council know because of uh, the influence and the ideas that you guys have about a program uh, Comcast is making available, and there'll be handouts uh, shortly, uh, for affordable Internet access. Uh, this broadband program is called Internet Essentials. It makes uh, broadband available in households who have children who qualify for the National School Lunch Program. Comcast has piggybacked on that national program as a criteria, and as a making efforts like this and, and some outreach in the schools, uh, boys and girls clubs, and any other channels and avenues that you may suggest uh, for broadband access to those households for $9.95. Along with that, there'll be uh, a device, I was going to say a computer, but uh, it's more of a, it's a smaller device, um, that'll be made available for $150, and there will also be um, some training that will go along with this so that uh, There'll be uh, literacy. This training will be in person, in print, as well as online. So uh, I would uh, encourage you to look at the handout, and please give me a call. I think most of you have my information or can uh, readily get it available. Um, for any suggestions you might have as to where else we can uh, get this uh, outreach uh, going in the community. Thank you. Next is Kevin Reed, followed by Lotus. Hi, my name is Kevin Reed. I live at <clears throat> 3117 River Bend Avenue in Gillum neighborhood. Um, I didn't really intend to come up here and speak. I didn't realize that when I filled out that green slip, that's what I was going to be doing. But I would like to say thank you so very much for listening to all sides of a very, very important issue that all of the, all your constituents were concerned about and weighing out both sides of it. I, I appreciate that. We all appreciated that. We appreciate you listening to our concerns because then we feel as though we're being heard and isn't that really what it's all about. So again, thank you so very much. Lotus is next, followed by Ali Valkyrie. Hello, my name is Lotus, and I am a resident at Washington Jefferson Park on the occupation. I am here today on behalf of my daughter, Sophia, who is sitting out here with me. The reason that I am here is because I grew up in a household where no one looked each other in their faces. I grew up in a society where no one took the time to find out what needs weren't being met by those around them. I don't want my daughter to grow up in a place like this. I want to speak about the camping van and the December 15th deadline, and I would really, really, really like to encourage everyone here to consider lifting the camping van permanently. The reason that I say this is because in my time on the occupation, which hasn't been horribly long, but more, most of the, the time, <coughs> I have met so many people that have looked me in the face, that have cared about what I'm doing, regardless of whether or not they knew me, regardless of whether or not money was involved, regardless of whether or not I could give anything back to them. And that, I feel, is so very important because we are building a community of people who support each other. I want to stay on site at the physical location because I feel that the relationships that we are building and the community that is starting there is paramount 
in the kind of world that I would like my daughter to live in. I left my house, I left my school, my job, my vehicle. I left everything that I had so that I could go and camp because I believe that my presence is my protest to corporate greed and to the problem that we have in our society. I have watched people who started out screaming, running through camp for hours on end, be accepted and welcomed in and become an active member of society. I've seen lives be saved. I know it's cold out there. I know it's rainy and dirty, but I can tell you that I would absolutely rather my four-year-old be with those people who look each other in the face and take care of each other than I would want to be anywhere else. And I would urge everyone in this council and everyone in this room to come out and join us. Next is Ellie Valkyrie, is that right? Yes, followed by Bridget Baird. Hi there, um, Ali Valkyrie. I technically live at 1760 Olive Street in Ward 1, but I have been uh, pretty much occupying in Ward 7 for the past several weeks now. Um, previous to the op occupation, my daily routine used to take me past the corner of Broadway and Olive once, twice, often three times a day. I kind of felt like I adopted this corner. I know it well. I know the people there, the business owners, the problems that are on that corner. I'm a member of Saturday Market, and admittedly, I drink at the horse head. And so uh, all hours of the day, I am very aware of the conflict between a disenfranchised population that has nowhere to go and nothing to do, and residents and business owners that resent the presence of this population and the influence that it brings. Uh, in the past six weeks, I've been immersed in this challenging yet beautiful community experiment that, as many others have said here, I encourage you to all come and experience. But what I've noticed is in the creation of this Occupy community, it has had an unintended but significant effect on that other little corner I love, the corner of Broadway and Olive. The uh, disenfranchised population that has been considered the bane of downtown for years is suddenly and for the first time engaged in community building elsewhere. They have something to do. They are creating change. They are no longer hanging out at the corner of Broadway and Olive or in the alley behind the Wow Hall. They are no longer creating the problems that this city has failed to solve for years and years and years. For the first time, they are involved with something meaningful. I've spoken with downtown business owners, downtown residents, and several kind but unnamed officers of the Eugene Police Department, and all agree that downtown has been much more manageable and peaceful since the occupation. An answer to a problem that we have not been able to solve for years is right before your eyes. It's sitting in the park. It is being tended to by dedicated and amazing humans who often are giving up their own homes, their own lives, their own jobs, their own security. I have not worked for six weeks. This means so much. I, I cannot possibly impress upon you the change that is happening on these grounds and the effect that it is having through many sectors of the city and the downtown is, is just one of many things that is being improved by this Occupy. But I, I just mentioned downtown to you specifically so that you understand and realize that Occupy is having effects on social issues in this town that we didn't even realize they would. And I hope you recognize the potential for this movement to create lasting and significant and amazing social change in the city if it is allowed to continue. Please allow it to continue. Thank you. Bridget Baird is next, followed by, looks like, Scotty Peary. Hi. My name is Bridget Baird, and I live at Occupy Eugene. The occupation is my permanent home right now. Everyone at the Occupy is there for a greater cause. We are all united in our stand against the economic inequality and corporate greed. However, many of us are there for our own individual reasons. For me, a part of the Occupy is my recovery from my meth addiction. I have been clean and sober now for 35 days, and I was only able to do this because of Occupy. I came there a user, and now I am clean. I would have never been able to achieve this if not for the community support of my family and my friends with the Occupy. To me, it is an essential part of my sobriety. Occupy is so important to me and so many others. 
I ask you please to at least allow the occupied to stay at the park throughout the holidays and the new year. Allow us to stay as a family for the holidays. We are a community. We love each other. We take care of each other. And we keep each other safe. We are creating a change in a safe place. Please, I beg you, allow us to continue. And when and if the Occupy has to end, please allow us to stay and to rebuild somewhere else as a permanent camp as a family. Just want to add before I close that right before I left camp tonight, a man who had heard my story at a community breakfast a few weeks ago came up to me tonight. And he told me that I inspired him to go clean and sober. He is staying at the Occupy starting tonight in a section of camp that I call Recovery Alley. I am proud to have inspired someone else to go clean. Thank you. Scott, Scotty Perry is next, followed by John Monroe. I have to follow that. Um, my name is Scotty Perry. I live at 715 um, West 23rd. I'm in George's district, and I'm also in the Occupy District number 7 right now. Um, Long-time resident since 1988, UVO alumnus, 1994. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you guys all for letting us be where we are right now. I really appreciate that from the bottom of my heart. And I'm not here to make an appeal for your guys' vote for an extension. I'm really here to make an appeal for you guys' consensus. It would mean a lot to us. Um, this wasn't part of my prepared statement, but, you know, I just want to say as far as the whole hypocrisy about, you know, the fact that I love my iPhone, um, we're not anti-capitalism. We're just anti-corruption. We want the playing field to be fair. That's all. Um, uh, you know, excuse me for using a fork. I mean, where are we going to draw the line? Come on. Um, <laughs> and contrary to the letter in the paper you might have seen today from Paul Barnett, I'm not only employed, but I love my job. It's the reason, it, it, I love it. It's the reason my reputation precedes me as a music teacher in this town. It's the reason why I have a waiting list of 20 families in this town. And obviously my time is very, very precious. And for the last six weeks of my life, I have been putting my heart and my soul, every ounce of energy that I have into this, the thing that I've waited for my whole entire life. And why is that? It's because I have seen lives changed before my very eyes. It's real people. Yeah, I could go on and on. Um, I'm kind of turning into an Occu preacher lately, <laughs> I feel. Um, but I just want to give two, ch <laughs> two challenges to all of you. Um, please reach out to downtown. Like Ali said, you know, go and talk to downtown business people. Ask them what the change has been in the last six weeks. I think you will find pretty much across the board that there has been a palpable change in the scenario down there. And I think it's been for the betterment of downtown. Um, and the other thing is on that same on that same note, um, talk to the service organizations in this town and see how their bottom line has been affected. Um, I, you know, I don't know the numbers, but it wouldn't surprise me if there's been a little bit of significant relief on the parts of all those organizations too. Thank you so much. John Monroe is next, followed by Charles Hibbert. Uh, my name is John Monroe. I currently reside at Occupy Eugene in Ward 7. Um, and I'm speaking on behalf of myself tonight, not on behalf of any organization. What I want to bring up is a phrase that's used a lot in politics today, but which doesn't actually mean too much in our current society, and that's the notion of the civil society. The civil society is what rests in between the private lives of families and groups of friends and then the larger public space of government operations and large commercial projects. The civil society is when people voluntaristically come together to support one, one another in networks of communities because they feel that it is in their own best benefit to help the people around them. If we look at different kinds of cultural anthropologies and comparative anthropologies, civil societies, even though most cultures didn't use that name, made up the bedrock of the social services and the support networks which kept people up when they were down. When people were emotionally or financially or physically unsafe, civil society reached out to help them. 
They were not government-mandated programs. They were not privatized operations. They were volunteer networks without the names because it was so obvious to people that they should have them that they didn't talk about the lack thereof. The reason I'm involved in Occupy Eugene is it is a radically inclusive attempt, in my opinion, to recreate civil society. The reason we do not create any political boundaries for who can be involved or any economic boundaries for who can participate is because civil society does not look at any of these socioeconomic differentiations. Civil society is built upon the direct relation of human being to human being. And what we're trying to cultivate here, and what we're working on constantly on an experimental methods, is trying to rebuild a civil society as a gift for all those people who have been raised without it, who have been raised that you either need to go to a government office in order to receive your basic needs, or you have to go to a specific job in order to receive a payment. It's not that we're anti-commerce. That's not it at all. I happen to love working. I like to work for companies that do good things for their people. But as Mr. Callahan accurately pointed out, it's very difficult to have your needs met without going through the corporate system that has been built. They've privatized so much of our basic needs at this point and pushed very consciously and very actively against civil society networks in order to privatize them and profit off of them, that the freedom to work together has actually been marginalized. The Occupy, if it has a political stance, is simply to affirm the fact that human beings should have the rights to help one another, the support to help one another, and the community to have their own needs met so they, they can continue their work. Thank you very much. Charles Hayward is next, followed by Black Horse Shasta. My name is Charles Hibbard, and I've got a business down on West 11th, and I live in uh, uh, down on River Road area. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it sounds to me like we have a social problem where the, the, the net to help these people that are drug addicts or down and out and that have failed them, and now they're hanging out there and occupy uh, Eugene, and the city council is supporting these people. If they had their way, the people down at the mall this weekend on Black Friday, they wouldn't, wouldn't have had any business. And the hard-working businesses, I can guarantee you, you can go to any one of those small business people in this town, and we rely on big business and what they, they develop and what they uh, create so that we can have a small business here and sell products or become uh, successful. Uh, I moved from, the, uh, from South Africa many years ago, and I remember standing in a Vaughn store and I had to make a decision bet between buying uh, cheese or sauce for some spaghetti because that's, I had like $3 in my pocket and I couldn't afford both. Within uh, 18 months, I was earning like $200,000 a year because I got out there, I realized the opportunities, and I took them and I worked my butt off and I've been through hard times, I've been through uh, very difficult times, but this anti-corporation type of uh, anti-American, it's anti-American. If they are their way, they have the same, they want to undermine the, 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 the financial system America has, has built America to this, what it is today. What they need to do is go to Congress. As Congress that has screwed up our country. They're the ones that made the laws that allowed the system to collapse. It was Congress that got these housing bubbles uh, creating their laws and regulations. These guys should be down at Congress and the lawmakers, not <laughs> at the banks. Bank of America is not going to walk out and write them a check. What do they expect? They need to uh, find out where the real problem is, and it's not the big corporations and it's not the banks. Thank you. The last person today is Black or Shasta. Good evening. My name is Black or Shasta. I live at 961 Almaden Street, Eugene. And uh, I'm just here to express my gratitude for every single one of you um, for being open and uh, allowing us to come this far with Occupy Eugene. I, it's such an honor to be a part of this community here in Lane County. I came from California a couple years ago and have just been so amazingly um, impressed and just w heart warmed by the sense of community here and uh, not only from you know our local um, uh, 
from everybody, from from your, your from your guys' support, from from everybody that I've met here. It's just been a wonderful experience, and uh, I've been so warmed by seeing so many lives being changed by allowing to be in this community environment. Uh, I think that uh, this country was built on freedom and this uh, this opportunity to express that uh, means a great deal uh, to every single person in America. And I think that uh, being by being open to us to have the freedom of assembly and by us building community together, I think that uh, we're making a strong statement for the world and I'm just really really taken away um, by the support that you've given so far and I, I hope that that continues. And I know there's challenges uh, along the road and I, uh, I just ask for patience um, so that uh, we can work, work things out that may not be perfectly balanced, um, but uh, we're, 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 uh, we're t being left off with a really broken society and uh, we're, we're uh, rebuilding it and rebalancing it and, and uh, I think that we're We've got a lot of talent in our community and a lot of people that you know are stepping up um, to this Occupy Eugene site to offer amazing skills. And, uh, and thank you for all your support and have a nice night. I'm going to close the public forum. And um, before I turn to other counselors, I just wanted to say thank you for everybody who came. I want to say actually... Thank you for the kind hearts you brought with you tonight. I didn't hear anybody express anything in a way that wasn't trying to look out for the interest of others. And I appreciate all of that. I know that there are people in the room who agree or disagree, but I think one thing you can't di about Occupy Eugene, but I think the one thing you can't disagree is the whole heart of the people who came and spoke to us tonight. So with that, I will turn to Councilor Pryor. Thank you. Um, like the mayor, I want to thank everybody um, for coming um, this evening. And I appreciate the very heartfelt, um, passionate feeling that people have. And um, I've been one of the folks that has supported um, the Occupy um, waiver on, on camping. And I've been willing to extend that through December 15th. And one of the things I asked at the time was, is there a way we can figure out how to, to make this evolve to whatever next level it is, at least from the the standpoint of what the Occupy movement originally was in its Wall Street form. If the speakers tonight are to be believed, 90% of the camp now is homeless people. And homelessness and poverty are significant issues. They are enormous issues. And I think they're issues that have to be addressed. Whether camping is the best way to address homelessness in the long term um, is the right solution. I don't know if anybody really thinks it is. But in the short term and in the situation we're in now, right now, I would love to see if we can come up with some solutions around that. If the Occupy movement in Eugene is, to a significant degree, homelessness resolving drug addiction problems, and I want to thank, if it is indeed true, those of you who are working to resolve drug, alcohol, and um, other kinds of issues, in, in your own society, that's a, that's a wonderful thing. And if you can continue that, that's a wonderful thing. And so the question I would say is, is the ability to, to make that society functional and work well dependent on your compassion and spirit, or is it the geography? Maybe it's not the geography. Maybe it is your passion and spirit, and that passion and spirit can find a place that can dwell longer and not have to be in the place it's in right now. I'm concerned that continuing in that specific location may not be in the best long-term interests of you and the community. There may be a place that together we can work to try to find a, a better solution. So, so what I would offer is not a challenge, but more of an invitation. Will you work with us as a city to see if we can reach a mutually agreeable consensus on where this might be able to take place on a more sustained basis. I don't believe it can continue where it is now. But can we find a solution? Because I think you are beginning to create something that may be remarkable. And I don't want to kill something that's remarkable, but I can't just continue something in its current form. I invite you to see if you're willing to work with us to the degree you already have. Can we continue that relationship to find something to show the rest of the country that by working together, we can solve this. If you're willing to, 
I at least am willing to as well. And to the man from Comcast, if you're still here, thank you. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful thing to offer. Um, people need those kinds of things. Councillor Farr. I'll pass, Mayor. Councillor Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Councillor Pryor, for your words. I agree with him um, wholeheartedly. Um, from my view, and thank you to the gentleman from Comcast. I think that's totally awesome. I don't want to lose that. <laughs> in, in, I mean, I, that would, is really going to impact a lot of families, and I think it's really good. It equal, gives equalization to people who can't afford that as a luxury. Um, as far as, okay, hi, Carla. <laughs> good to see you. Um, I always feel like I'm like, um, what was that program on TV that, that I spy with my little eye? Anyway, um, I agree with Councilor Pryor's comments about where do we go from here is what I'm hearing. My belief, though, that the synergy that's happening in my ward, which I am proud of, um, is that this is something that the, the people have decided that's what they're going, what they're, where they're going to be and that's what they're going to do. And I, in my heart of hearts, knew that there would be a positive impact on this community because I believe people have the best intents and you've proven me right in, in my spirit. So I'm really, I'm really glad you guys are doing some good stuff. I have been to the Occupy um, site and I, and I was very impressed. Michael took me on a tour and, and um, I, I think that I'm definitely of the mind to let's talk some more and let's see where we can go from here. As far as as Occupy staying in a bridge, under, in a park under a bridge during the waning weather, that is challenging to me. I would not be the one to tell you where to go. That's something we're going to have to work on together. I don't have an answer for you. So I just appreciate everybody coming down and sharing their opinions with us. Thank you. We're going to move on our agenda. So again, I say thank you to all of you. And um, we're going to move on to our next action. We did our consent calendar uh, at our work session, so we don't have to do that. So now we're on to the next item, <coughs> which, it, which is an ordinance extending the sunset date for the rental housing code. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Action on the rental housing code this evening is to consider extension of the current sunset date of December 31st, 2011 for a nine-month period September 30th, 2012. This will provide for time for further evaluation of the program and to follow up on several issues previously expressed by counselors and the public. During this recommended nine-month extension, no annual fees will be billed for the next fiscal year. Thank you. You want to put a motion on the table? Yes. I move to adopt Council Bill 5056, extending the sunset date for the rental housing code nine months to September 30th, 2012. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, just one quick comment is that I really appreciate the communication that we uh, got where John Van Landingham finished up his comments that he did, couldn't finish up at the podium. And I thought one of the things that was very provocative about his comment was that he thinks that we could look at our, um, our rental um, uh, rental housing code and, and try to figure out how we make that program work so that it, um, it is as helpful to um, those who own the property as it is to those who rent, that it works for everybody and is, and, and is supported from both sort of sides of the spectrum. So I think I'm willing to support an extension so we can strive to find out how to make that be a satisfactory program to everyone. I'm going to call on um, Councillor Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. I, I agree. I think that we should find, um, we, ha we have two customers. We have the, the owners of the property and we have the renters, and I think we need to serve them both. I'm, the only reason I wanted to speak was that I'm a little challenged by the date, it, nine months. I understand that we are not going to be billing because we just billed in October. Um, but I, I would hope that we could find a little bit quicker time frame, city manager. Uh, you know, I'm not going to make a motion or anything or change it, but if you and your um, planning your calendar and your wisdom and the work, double work that your staff has, um, if that could happen, that would be great. Thank you. Councilor Clark. Thank you, Mayor. I, too, would support what Councilor Ortiz said there, that um, six, I, I would prefer six months. I won't make that amendment, but I would prefer <laughs> that. Um, I'm of two minds about this. There's obviously a problem when you have one side of the, the transaction who all seem to be unanimously upset about it. The public testimony was pretty clear about that. 
um, I see some of the challenges. I see property owners who um, have had to prove their innocence in a particular case we were told about that seemed very distressing to me. Um, obviously, monies have been collected in excess of the need, and we've expanded the program to fit the budget rather than the other way around. So those were concerning to me. But at the same time, uh, there have been those who testified about the number of complaints that were worked on for the dollar amount there. And that discounts, I think, this mechanism being in place because there, while most landlords do a, a good job and are fair and are great people in our community, there are those few and occasional bad apples. And I think this policy serves to allow for them to be communicated with, to come up to code and not have it be a compliance action, but rather serves as a, as a, as a backstop for those renters' safety. And so a part of me understands this. So I'll support this as it's currently laid out as a motion, um, but would prefer that it was six months and be, would be much happier under the, the provision that I understood you correctly, we won't be billing for this next cycle because of the surplus funds that we have there. Do I have that right? Correct. On that basis, I think I can support it. Councilor Poling. Thank you. <clears throat> I, too, was, you know, John, uh, city manager, when we first had the discussion in one of our one-on-one -on -one meetings about the, the extension, the, the nine months sound reasonable, but as the, the discussion progressed, I, I too feel that that's a little bit too long. Uh, Six-month extension would be good. I'm not going to push the issue on that either. Uh, however, when we do have our next conversation, I'm going to be looking at the uh, the <laughs> fee that we charge and, um, you know, how it relates to the budget. And also, I'm concerned about other issues trying to creep into this ordinance. Uh, we came very close to allowing uh, support rental housing code revisions for energy efficiency <laughs> to be part of the sustainability work plan had that not been brought up at, at that meeting. And we directed the Sustainability Commission to go ahead and, and you know, reword that. You know, there's no telling where that would have gone. Uh, I'm not real happy with the rewording that they've presented on that uh, at this point. But, you know, this ordinance was set up for very specific and very narrow um, uh, topics. And I'm really concerned about other things starting to creep in because it's already started. So when we have our next discussion on that, I'm going to be looking at where we are on that. I will support the extension at this time based on on uh, what I've heard tonight and, and basically what uh, Councilor Ortiz and um, Councilor Clark have said also. So I think you didn't hear a motion, but you heard a push. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Would you please vote? Eight in favor and none in opposition. It passes. Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. All right. Next item up is the <coughs> approval of funding for housing affordable to low-income persons. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. The Council is asked to take action this evening regarding the commitment of home funds, city SDC waivers, <coughs> and the disposition of the county farm land bank site for construction of Bascom Village. Bascom Village is a 101-unit affordable rental development proposed in partnership by St. Vincent de Paul Society of Lane County and the Housing and Community Services Agency of Lane County. The request for action follows a recommendation by the Intergovernmental Housing Policy Board. The Housing Policy Board held a neighborhood forum and two public hearings prior to forwarding its recommendation. The Council held a work session and a public hearing earlier this month. All right, shall we put the motion on the table? Sure. I move to approve the Phase 1 development of Bascom Village. One, transfer of the western portion of the county farmland bank site to SVDP, St. Vincent de Paul. Two, commitment of $351,603 in home funds. And three, provide for 249593 in Eugene SDC waivers. And to also approve for phase two development of Bascom Village. One, transfer of the eastern portion of County Farm Land Bank site to Haska. Haxa. Uh, two, commitment of $249,603 in home funds. And three, provide for 
$224,346 in Eugene SDC waivers. In addition, make a recommendation to EWEB to approve an SDC grant for each phase of the project. Second. Moved and seconded. Councilor Clark. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to move to, I guess, uh, supplant the motion with the postponement until December 12th. And if I get a second, I'll speak to that. Second for purposes of discussion. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, Mike Reeder, who's the attorney hired by the neighbors, um, sent us an email today which spawned my thinking a little bit more about this. And certainly the council and the Housing Policy Board has been very good to go outside their normal process and allow the neighbors to be heard on this. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that many of my neighbors in Ward 5 don't feel as though their their concerns were um, worked into the policy because we just the process hasn't allowed the time to alter this particular RFP or this particular proposal in a way that would mitigate those concerns adequately. But I, I and I and I know it's it's reasonable because it's left the council with kind of an up or down yes or no choice on this. And and I we have seen uh, a lot of good um, testimony about why. We obviously need more affordable housing, and certainly if you're going to have a, a project like this, you'd want to have St. Vincent de Paul build it. They do fa fantastic work. But we've heard little in terms of some details about what potential options could be. And in his presentation today in his email, one of the things that Mr. Reeder mentioned was the idea that perhaps this land, the, the value of land banking can be captured by selling this site and taking the net proceeds and looking at other more appropriate places that may actually serve the needs of affordable housing better. And he listed several particular parcels where those are possible. Now, we don't have time here to go through the details of each of those particular items and decide whether or not it's a good idea. So my motion is to postpone for two weeks so that it doesn't harm the project, but it gives us adequate time to evaluate whether or not there's any potential in the alternatives presented to see if it's reasonable at all that we could serve uh, the neighbors better and their concerns and as well perhaps serve affordable housing in our community better as well. Thank you. Councillor Pryor. Um, is Stephanie here? Oh, Becky's here. Um, question I would have is um, this project depends on a number of um, external funding, the home funds, for example. Could you give us a quick update on what the timing is for that cycle, um, how this delay would impact that, um, and um, any other considerations with regard to delaying a decision till December 10th with regard to the funding cycle or the project? 12th. The 12th, December 12th. Delaying till de December 12th wouldn't necessarily harm the funding cycle if you're meaning putting at the state level for additional funding we could delay two weeks if that gives staff time to answer questions from council if um, after two weeks it was determined that this site was a more desirable site and we didn't want to use that site and so we wanted to shift the project all around um, what would that involve with regard to the project itself and to the funding cycle Delaying past the first of the year would, would affect the developer's ability to apply in April to the state for the majority amount of funding for the project. <coughs> Delaying and researching another site also causes additional cost to the developers to create a new proposal. Each proposal submitted is site specific, so that means going back to their architect, going back to their team, spending more time and money. Have, do you have any sense, since the home funds operate on a yearly cycle, mm. do you have a sense of what the potential availability of home funds will be in the next cycle? So we heard a couple of weeks ago that the House and Senate have proposed a 38% cut to the home funds specifically. That was the largest cut to the housing funds. And so we're really uncertain about what funds will be available in the future. Although that's not, the 38% is not definite at this point, but that's what's been proposed. 
there was a, I believe, a 12% cut last year and a 1% cut the year prior. Okay, so the program wouldn't be eliminated altogether, but it could be cut by over a third. Right, so a 38% cut to the home funds nationally equates, and this is just a guesstimate, the city would probably lose approximately 450000 um, And if in two weeks a site, the site was determined, well, it looks like a good site, but we still wouldn't necessarily have a buyer for our current site or know for sure the details of the seller for that site or what the prices were for it. In other words, there would still be a lot of moving parts. We wouldn't know the answer. So it's conceivable right. that in two weeks we might not have a lot more answers in order to make a decision and then? That's right. When we're looking at sites, there's many different pieces of the puzzle we're looking at and when we're looking at suitability. And, and a lot of that has to do with the requirements from HUD and their environ environmental review, social and environmental justice pieces. Okay. Uh, thank you. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. Thank you. Would it have to go back to the housing board again as well? If a new site were, cho were chosen? We more than likely would talk to the Housing Policy Board for their review of the site and its suitability. Thank you. Councilor Brown? Thank you. Um, I can't support extending it for two weeks. Um, I believe that we've had plenty of time to evaluate all the objections. I, I spent Sunday night reading all of Mr. Reeder's multi-page uh, presentation and didn't find any of the arguments convincing, personally. Um, I, I think that this is a, a really good project. I think the placing of the project is very good. Uh, it's a step down. It's not plumped down in the middle of the neighborhood. It's on the edge. It's on a major street. It's, it fills lots of really good requirements. If we were to sell this to a private developer, this plot of land, they could put up many more units there. Uh, it would be you know, zoned for that. So, um, and they could be uh, a lot less tasteful than what St. Vincent plans to put there. Uh, Two-week delay, that's not nearly enough time to evaluate much less complete, complicated real estate transactions. Finding a buyer for this parcel, maybe no one wants to buy it right now. There's not a lot of real estate activity going on. So fine, we find, let's say we find a buyer and then negotiating with the other property owners, um, it's, it's just impossible. It's, it's way too late for that. I think it's time to move the project forward. It's, it's a very good project and I, I will support the project, but I'm not going to support the delay. Thank you. Councilor Farr. Thank you, Mayor. You know, it's difficult not to support um, deliberative thinking. And if two weeks gives us an opportunity to think a little bit more clearly about this, then uh, it would be, once again, difficult not to support it. But my questions surround the funding um, and the jeopardizing, jeopardization of, the, uh, of potentially building the housing. Um, if we were to extend it two weeks, and if after two weeks we determined that other sites were preferable to this site, uh, could you discuss the, how it would jeopardize the potential of, uh, of receiving the funds, the HUD funds, uh, receiving uh, um, the go-ahead to actually build, it, build on a different site? And could you also address about how long it would take in terms of the uh, entire process, realizing that's an uh, estimation? So these projects on the land bank sites are usually what we call tax credit projects. They're go the developers will, in April, submit an application to the state for low-income housing tax credits. That happens once a year, and it has been in April for the last few years, and it's a funding cycle that is awarded in, in August. I beg your pardon, Becky. Is that specific to a particular site, or is that just in general? But it, when the developers apply at the state level, it is for the specific site. Thank you. So if we were to delay and find another site, it wouldn't give enough time for the developers to present a proposal to staff, housing policy board, and ultimately council again to make it in the 2012, what's called the consolidated funding cycle at the state level. So basically we'd be delaying for a year they would have to apply to the state in April of 2013. And with that delay, we would uh, jeopardize the potential funding from the federal 
of the federal level? There are timeliness issues with both CDBG and home funding, and we're supposed to allocate and spend down funds within two years of the allocation. And one further question uh, regarding the uh, disposition of uh, money that the city would receive for the sale of the property. Is that unrestricted when the money comes back to us? Should we sell the property? So this piece of property was purchased two-thirds CDBG funds, one-third general fund. And the regs state that the two-thirds portion of the money received on the sale of the property should be returned to our CDBG program. Although staff needs to speak with our HUD representatives a little bit more about the implications of that, there could be 30,000 foot level programmatic implications uh, as well as site implications. When I was the director of Food for Lane County, we had an issue with a, uh, a property that Food for Lane County owns downtown that was purchased in part with CDBG funds. Upon selling that property, any uh, appreciation in the value of the property would have been returned to CDBG and not to the, uh, not to the agency. Mm -hmm. Is that a similar situation that we're facing here? The, any, so we would need to sell the site for fair market value. The two-thirds of that fair market value would be turned to the city's CDBG program. And if the fair market value exceeds the purchase price, the, uh, the difference between the purchase price and the fair market value, where does that go? Is that allocated on a two-thirds, one-third basis? Or yeah, what we take a look at is the fair market price. So whatever we sell the site for, no matter how much more it is from what we purchased it, two-thirds will go into CDBG and one-third back to general fund. So that's different to the Food for Lane County mm -hmm. site. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councillor Clark. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate that information. I wasn't aware that the net difference comes back to the CG, the two-thirds of the net difference comes back to CDBG. <clears throat> is it, and if it were possible that another site then were, uh, were uh, potentially, um, could qualify for those funds, that could take advantage of that net difference as well, we'd have actually more money for the process. But that's not important to the particular motion, at least from my perspective. What I was hoping for is that we focus on the fact that nothing is lost <coughs> in delaying for two weeks. Uh, as I look at the December 12th schedule, it's a very light council evening schedule, and it's, it's not as if we're burdening ourselves to be here all night with that. Um, it simply gives two weeks, and it would certainly put the, uh, the onus of responsibility and all of the work on those who would want to, the neighbors that would want to see this uh, potentially moved elsewhere. Um, it would certainly put the homework requirement on them to present that in a way where all of the questions could be answered. Um, and they may have to ask staff some of that, but it would certainly be their responsibility. But I would hope that we would give the opportunity to at least get that information when there's no cost and no, no problems from the delay. Thank you. You don't want to speak to this motion? No, actually no. All right. Take your, you're out of the queue. And... Councilor Brown, you're in the queue. Thank you. Um, well, delaying it, I mean, you know, we've heard what the uh, consequence will be if we accept the idea of selling the property. It means there will be this delay and the new proposal, <laughs> assuming we can sell this property and buy another property between now and next April, that means the, de the developers will have to come up with a proposal for the state in April. That's a really tight schedule. I, I don't think that that can be done, frankly. So it's it's a kind of a useless exercise to delay this for two more weeks. We, we already have the information on the other sites. Um, I, I just can't see any value in delaying this. I, I think it's time for an up or down vote right now. It's, it's not going to present us any more information. I, I can't see any new information being brought forward in two weeks. It, it seems like a kind of a sterile exercise that will only damage the viability of the project. And, and, and it, assuming that someone could meet that April schedule next spring on a different piece of, of land, we've heard that they could be facing a 38% cut in the funds to build the project. So this, this just doesn't make any sense to me to delay this. Thank you. Councilor Zelenka. So 
extending this, ex an extended delay of this process certainly puts this, the project's funding in jeopardy. So to me, the question is, should we entertain a proposal to sell this property and do the project somewhere else? That's a process question, really, um, uh, without looking at the merits of any of the sites. Um, so what we would be doing if we did that is setting up a process whereby each and every time we have an affordable housing process project come up, we would be second guessing every single one of those projects and second guessing the entire process that it takes to do, plan one of these projects, lay and bank it, go through the process of doing an RFP and go through the, affordable, uh, through the housing policy board and then we would second guess every single one of those from here forth. And um, to me, that's what this motion sets up. It sets up that precedence. This is not a one-off to me. So with that being my perception of what this, the effect of this motion is, I can't support it. Um, I, I think that we have, uh, this process has had more, this project has had more process than uh, almost any affordable housing project in the history of the city of Eugene. Uh, it's had more people weigh in on it, more people discuss it, uh, and uh, this is kind of an 11th hour attempt to sidetrack the process, so I'm not going to support the process, the process change. Councillor Farr. Thank you, Mayor. Just um, a re clarification regarding uh, the, the profit or the additional funds that would, would be gained based on the appreciation of the property. I was told in no uncertain terms that every penny of the profit from the Food for Lane County profit, property would go back into the CDBG. Why is this different? Well, I wasn't around when the Food for Lane County site was sold. I wonder if, Mike, you have information about that? I guess I'm a little unclear on the history of that as well. It's been a long time. <clears throat> but I believe that uh, the equity from the uh, proposed sale of property, uh, maybe your intent was to move that to another project, yeah. but the equity was primarily block grant equity. Okay. So I so believe it needs to stay with the block grant program rather than move from project to project without going through a, re a, realloc <coughs> a reallocation. But uh, wouldn't this be moved from one project to another project? Well, that would have to have been approved through an allocation. So the Block Grant Committee meets every year, and they make decisions on nonprofit capital projects, which I believe that was a nonprofit cap. Uh, it, it was a capital project. Yeah. Some of the details are a little fuzzy. Mm -hmm. But I, I believe most of the equity or most of the original funds for that project came from the Block Grant program. Correct. So when the property would have been sold, the return on that equity would have gone back to the block grant program. The return on the equity would in that situation, but not in this situation. No, I think it's the same in this situation. Block grant funds were expended for the, the purchase of the land bank site. And to the extent the block grant funds are into the purchase, both the original capital and in essence, the return on that capital needs to go back to the block grant program. So the difference being the uh, percentage of the project for Food for Lane County that was purchased with CDBG. Indeed. The in that case, in, in, uh, whatever uh, Food for Lane County put in as their initial equity, they would receive a uh, commensurate return on that. Mm -hmm. So the property went up 50 percent over the course of a, a time that it was held. 50 percent uh, return would have been uh, uh, realized on the block grant funds. 50 percent return would be realized on the other funds. In this case, Two-thirds of the funds came from the block grant initially, so whatever percentage is realized on the return, that same percentage would apply both to the block grant funds and to the other funds, the general funds, in proportion. You know, without numbers, it's a little difficult to bring that across, but... Uh, you captured the spirit very well. Thank, thank you, Mike. You. Um, then my, my final question on that is uh, regarding uh, re returning this money to the CDBG. Uh, would, that would go through a, a further reevaluation process or a reallocation process? I believe it would go to year. the block grant uh, committee, right? So there is no guarantee that it would be uh, returned to a project of this type? Correct. Okay. okay, I think we're ready to vote on Mike's motion. Would you please vote? 
Two in favor and six in opposition. It goes down. We're back to the main motion. Would you please vote? Oh, I had a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. <laughs> it just popped up. <laughs> I looked. There was nothing there. Okay, Councilor Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just had a question. You know, one of the uh, comments that was made by the community and um, Stephanie spoke to it last week, I think, when we were asking her about the sidewalk issue. I just want to um, get a little bit more clarification and <coughs> probably just a head nod from the partners that they will, that they will work <coughs> together to make some kind of a safety issue remedy. And specifically sidewalk to the bus stop? Uh, whatever it was brought up. I mean, it sounded like there was no access at some point, and I was just kind of concerned about that. Sure. The staff and uh, community development staff and public work staff have been working hard together <coughs> to come up with some solutions to getting, whether it be a temporary or a permanent sidewalk, from the site to the bus stop that's south on Crescent Avenue. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Pryor. <coughs> Thank you. This, for, for me, has been one of the most challenging decisions I've had to face since I've been involved since the very beginning. And I've kind of watched <laughs> this evolve. And um, I've learned a lot of important lessons in doing this in terms of how we might in the future m be more mindful of how this integrates in with, with the community. <coughs> um, this is one of our last land bank sites, so we may not really have this issue in quite this form in the future, but it's still very instructive. and. One of the things I have heard very clearly from the neighbors, which I do take very seriously and I had at the Housing Policy Board, was the issue around infrastructure. Infrastructure around sidewalks, infrastructure around street capacity, um, uh, and I think those are still legitimate issues. And, and I hear <coughs> Councilor Ortiz say, I'd like to see head nods and I'd like to get some sort of uh, agreement that that's an, an important issue to look at. To me, I think the strength of that was important enough that I think uh, I would like to see something stronger than that. I would like to see this project go forward with um, an official um, endorsement by the City Council that these be dealt with, that the street capacity be reviewed and ensure that it meets the standard um, or that, it, that it's capable or, or has the capacity. But more so, I would want this project to go forward with the requirement that sidewalk access be provided because I don't want anybody um, to be at risk walking <coughs> in that project. So uh, wh whether it needs to be offered up as an amendment that sidewalks be integrated into the project, be incorporated in and be become a part of that project um, so that we can make sure <coughs> that that's, that's built into it. Um, in terms of the actual project itself, uh, I know there's been a lot of discussion. I know there's been a lot of discussion about <coughs> this is whether this project is okay or not. My my concern is it is one of our last sites. It's one of our last funding opportunities. While I will readily acknowledge we probably could have done the process better in some ways, we did slow down. We did do it better once we did realize there was an issue. There were some issues I think that were very legitimate. Some other ones that I think may be more based on fear than perhaps on what the reality may turn out to be. And I will work very hard to ensure that those fears are not realized. So I would offer an amendment to the motion um, that sidewalks um, be added as a provision to this project. Second. Want to accept that as friendly? We accept it as a friendly? Um, what's the motion? No. The motion is what's here. I'm offering a friendly to add um, the provision of sidewalks um, within the farm. From paid, paid for by whom? Huh? Uh, paid for by whom? Uh, Paid for by the developer. Okay, I'll accept it then. From from Parkview to to uh, Crescent. So you accepted it. Yes. Do you accept it? Parkview to Crescent. I, I don't really want to accept that. I I we, well then it's okay then then don't. It's okay. It's right. Okay. <laughs> I give you a second. You can. You, you're going to offer an amendment then. Instead? It's offered as an amendment. It has a second. It has a second. second. All right. If, if, on a proviso that it's Parkview to Crescent. So what I would like to hear from the manager is what uh, how he'd like to handle this. <laughs> yeah, I just could you. I'm sorry. Could you repeat what the amendment is? Just or so that that sidewalks um, from Parkview to Crescent be included in the project as part of its um, as part of the project. Okay, I guess I would have. Concerns would be. 
and additional costs are not included in the developers pro forma at this time and they'd have to do additional research to see where that money is going to come from which we could do waiting until the summer 12th and I guess part of it uh, one way to, to deal with this and I, I understand the concern I and uh, I'm not uh, at all concerned about moving in that direction one way you can do is to direct <coughs> me to investigate ways to provide the additional infrastructure to for, Bas uh, for Baskin Village we can come back with uh, the proposal on how to go about timing and funding and all those kinds of things and so um, that would be one way to do it then what I would be willing to do is if with the expectation that you will bring back a proposal to us and it, that might give you some more flexibility in terms of the financing options the funding I would be willing to withdraw the motion only on the expectation that you would bring back a proposal for how to provide that level of infrastructure yeah, yes okay we'll that the that. developer would provide that level of infrastructure well it would be whatever his proposal was we would bring back the proposal any dollars you would have to approve the expenditure of any city's dollars so if it was the developers at 100 percent that's different uh, process but you would have to as a council approve or appropriate any city dollars into the project and if at the time you didn't want to do that you would have the option yeah. of not doing that yeah. i don't know the full range of op financing options that might be available to the council to address the issue and so you're going to go investigate that so you'll investigate we want, bring it back. i just want to have enough time to have the and you've uh, withdrawn your motion be i've withdrawn my motion yeah, but be able to, to move it but does it require me to withdraw my second yes mm -hmm. My my concern here is that we are transferring the cost to the city to do this, and that no. that may jeopardize its passage by other members of the council. Jerry, can I ask a question? When you have a motion moved and seconded, does it require the the, um, the seconder to agree before you can withdraw the the, the originator can withdraw the motion? That's a Robert Rule question. Oh. So let's retool this. <coughs> It meets with and I'm not predisposed to the financing mechanism. I would just want staff to have the time to give you enough full information to make right. a good decision around it. If it provides, if it requires city funds. Do not see that requirement in, in the summary of Robert's <coughs> rules. So I think you can just withdraw. Okay. It's withdrawn. <coughs> Other <coughs> Councilor Polling. Thank you. Um, in the AIS, uh, Baskin Village is 101 units. Uh, let's see if I get this right. Targeted. Uh, let's see, 74 units are targeted for families and 27 units are targeted for seniors, singles, and couples. Uh, there was some discussion earlier about a project head start being placed in the, in the middle of this project. Um, and I think there was a question raised as to zoning or legality. Uh, that wasn't addressed in this week's AIS. What information did we come back with on that? The head start facility could come in once a conditional use permit has been approved yeah, well, and those that's that permit has been approved for other st. Vincent de Paul sites uh, Ross Lane has a head start that the conditional per use permit was approved for okay what would be the process for that land use application <laughs> and the other question that was raised was the 101 units versus 60 units that some of the the people brought up and can you address that issue so what we looked at, staff looked at uh, with the help of St. Vincent de Paul and some of the other providers was historical uh, lease up data and occupancy data. And although there's no steadfast rule about what a family unit consists of, data shows that less than 10% of one bedroom units contain <coughs> or have are occupied by a child. When we looked at what a family unit reasonably is we we decided okay we're going to look at the two bedroom two three four bedroom units and consider those as family units the housing dispersal policy defines a family unit as at least one adult and one child okay so then the actual number of people living in there is going to be well over the what um, 
if you start looking at the number of two two bedroom apartment or two bedroom units and everything else uh, it's a lot more than somebody looking at this say well it's just 101 units there's a substantial number of, of people that can actually live in that facility correct okay um, I do have some concerns also about not only the sidewalks but also the uh, bike lane sidewalks and width on county farm uh, also uh, I still have some concerns about bus, bus routes which hasn't been addressed and I have some concerns about the increased traffic on Matt Drive once they punch that through and again like I said at our last meeting I'm still hearing complaints from people that live on Arcadia from when they punched Arcadia through to allow the Meltebeck homes to be built uh, at the east end of Willa Kinsey. So there's still a lot of issues that have yet to be addressed and, and I would appreciate at least the you know, if we could have gone with Councillor Clark's decision, if I would be, be pushed to an up or down vote, I'm, I'm sorry, even though I do support and I have supported <coughs> affordable housing for a long, long time, I won't be able to support this, uh, the, the main motion as presented. I just think we need to step back. I don't, based on what we heard from the, 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 the community, the people that are actually involved that live around this, I don't believe there is adequate notification. Uh, there's some questions about well there's no no problems when Willow Kenzie Crossing went in that's true but when Willow Kenzie Crossing was the property rather for Willow Kenzie was put on the, the market that was when the school closed down and everybody knew at the time that there was going to be a three acre park and five acres for affordable housing I brought that up based on the input from the people in my neighborhood and my um, home uh, neighborhood association desire for that to be all all park um, that that didn't go anywhere so I I did support the the uh, the affordable housing project in there so there was some input at the very onset and people knew at the time because they were living around there when that went up this is is property that was vacant when it was land banked and now we have houses built up around it and I just don't think that we had adequate notification Councilor Zelenka um, if I understand what <coughs> Councilor Clark and Pryor were trying to do is uh, a sidewalk from Parkview all the way down to Crescent, uh, uh, which is probably about 1,100 or 1,000, 1,200 feet. Um, I actually drove out there and sat on County Farm Road right where the project was, <coughs> and I looked to my left, and there was the bus stop 100 feet away. On Coburg Road, that's the nearest bus stop. There's two bus stops. They're actually on either side of the road, um, and uh, so I'm puzzled why we would force the developer to build a 1,200-foot sidewalk all the way to Crescent, which is much further away than just to the simple uh, uh, so to the nearest bus stop, which is right there on Coburg Road, which you can actually see and probably Pat could throw a rock and hit. Uh, <laughs> Especially if there's an exit on the game farm road of the project, and, and so I, I don't, I don't, I don't support that provision. If you are going to do that, Mr. City Manager, I would suggest you also look at the alternative of, uh, of putting a sidewalk to the nearest bus stop, which is probably 100 feet away, which is just across the intersection there uh, to Coburg across Game Farm Road, which has been exactly like that for. How long has that bus stop been there? Probably 20 years. So um, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that the, this is a, a, a need for the amount of people that are there. Eventually, I think we should have sidewalks all over the city. But I don't think that I think that putting this burden onto the developer would be potentially very expensive and would dramatically impact the project by cutting out some amenity that will make the project. Uh, were uh, n not as uh, as acceptable than it is as proposed. So, I don't support this motion. Th that provision of the of the uh, head nodding part of the council. <coughs> Councilor Clark. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate the manager's willingness to bring this forward, at least to the stop sign there, at least to some degree of safety. Is my concern for the kids who will be going down that gravel edge road. And we have had testimony that just with this development, we're looking at 35 to 100 kids um, down the side of a gravel road where very large trucks travel frequently. And I think it's a prescription for danger. So I'm, I'm happy that you'll be bringing that forward for us to contemplate and consider. 
Um, the, I, I wish we were uh, considering other options here, of course, and in a shocking development, I'll probably be voting no on the overall motion. Um, for me, the issue isn't about affordable housing, as has been said by many of my neighbors. And that's why I was interested in bringing up the idea of how can we create a better opportunity for affordable housing. For me, it's the cluster we're creating here. It's the, it's the simple fact that I, I think evidence has been very clear that we're simply not following our housing dispersal policy. Um, I, I don't know how you can read this objectively and not see that. The intended goal of the dispersal policy isn't about the number of units. It's about not clustering a large amount of low-income families in one place. And between the development, which is right next door on Matt Drive, and the proposed multifamily unit, 160 unit just to the north, and this development, you are in fact clustering a very large number of low-income folks in one place. There's no other way to read it than we're not following the housing dispersal policy's intent and goal. So for me, I, I simply can't support it. Councilor Farner. <clears throat> um, thank you, Mayor. You know, I've, I've been following this fairly closely. Um, I've, I've attended the public hearings and spoken at length with, in private with, uh, with people on both sides of the issue. Um, on November 9th, I stayed until the lights were turned out at Sheldon Community Center listening. And uh, uh, certainly we have uh, a number of issues. I, it's been narrowed down to, I guess, more or less six issues, which are process, transportation, road issues, emergency response, service access for the new residents, schools, and Eugene's housing disposal policy. And throughout this, I've looked to see whether or not we have addressed each of the six areas. Uh, and, uh, and by and large, while in my years on the council, I've never seen us fully address any one issue, uh, we've, I think we've been a, I have personally seen a good effort in, uh, in addressing the issues. Uh, consequently, um, it boils down to me the fact that uh, whatever I may think and whatever people may say, this really is about affordable housing. And uh, to me, the bottom line is putting kids in homes. Um, and uh, uh, if, uh, in, in my <coughs> estimation, the, uh, the six areas have been addressed adequately to the point where uh, I'm not prepared to say no to kids going into homes at this point in time. I think uh, we need to move forward, forward as quickly as possible. And, uh, and I will be a yes on this. Councilor Zelenka. Recently, we had a presentation at the, from the Sustainability Commission on 20-minute neighborhoods, and two of the maps that we got from them were maps of the city that plotted out distances, bus stop distances, whether or not uh, what parts of the city were, had that amenity, uh, where they were uh, less than a quarter mile, quarter mile to half, more than a half a mile. And when you look at this chart, what you see is that almost all of the city is is uh, um, within a quarter mile of a bus stop, <clears throat> including the area that we're talking about. Um, so this particular spot is really no different than it mo a lot of the other places uh, when uh, in the city with regard to how far it is from a bus stop. Second one we saw was a, another graph that looked at sidewalk density the length of sidewalks uh, and, and uh, within a quarter mile, whether or not they had sidewalks in a quarter mile. And uh, when you look at that, it's kind of a hodgepodge of things, but um, most of the city, or uh, there are big swaths of the city that don't have sidewalks and don't have accessibility, including this part of the town uh, and, and city. So I, I'm wondering if, if what we're doing here is, is saying that Every time a development comes in, it has to have sidewalks and it has to all the way to the nearest bus stop, which means that every single development in the city of Eugene is going to have a problem because they have to buy, add this to the project cost of it. And uh, if the development community uh, knows that that's what we're going to do every time we uh, approve a project in the city, um, I think they would be pretty outraged by it. Okay, I think we're ready to uh, vote on this. So, would you please vote? We have six in favor and two in opposition. It passes. Thank you. On to the next item. Number five 
is the action of the approval of the Sustainability Commission amended work plan. <coughs> City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. This is an action item to approve the Sustainability Commission amended work plan. As you will recall, the Commission discussed its FY12 work plan with you at a work session on October 19, 2011. There was some concern raised about the item in the work plan that recommended expanding the rental housing code to address energy efficiency. You requested changes to that item prior to approval. The wording on that <coughs> plan item has been changed to reflect your input and we're submitting an, amendment, an amended work plan for your approval tonight. Thank you. you. Want to put the motion on the table? I move to approve the Sustainability Commission FY12 work plan as amended. Second. Moved and seconded. <coughs> Councillor Poling. Is there anybody here that can tell me what encourage energy efficiency when addressing health and safety issues in the rental housing program really means? Abel Sullivan's here from uh, our staff. Good evening. I'm joined by Josh Scove, the chair of the Sustainability Commission, who can speak to this as well. Josh, we'll give you the floor first if you'd like. Uh, I think the, the intent of the changes, and we did try to uh, make all of the changes that were suggested by council uh, in the work plan. Uh, the intent of the changes was, was just to explore this issue but not make it something that would add to regulatory burden or would expand the mandate of the of the code. That was really the, the concern as we understood it when it came up in the meeting. <coughs> but it would, we felt it was left on the table that we could explore this because of all of the other ways in which we're uh, through various policy documents and plans looking at energy efficiency, like the Climate and Energy Action Plan first and foremost. But it was definitely just an exploratory action. Do you want to yeah, I think what I would also add to that is part of your discussion, particularly from uh, Council Member Zelenka, was looking at the tie between the current um, health and safety issues that are covered by the code and the opportunity to look at energy efficiency upgrades when those health and safety issues are being addressed. So it was trying to capture that opportunity to address both uh, when health and safety issues are at hand with a particular project. Thank you. Um, I'm still apprehensive about allowing this in. Uh, like I said earlier, there's, you know, the rental housing code is subject to creep, stuff creeping in, and I don't want to see that happen. So um, I guess there's really no real guarantee that there won't be an effort to make energy efficiency part of the rental code housing based on what I'm hearing, or is there a guarantee that this won't occur, or do, do we even know? Well, the most, the most damage we could do would be merely to make a suggestion, if that makes you feel any better about it. Uh, but, the, uh, but I think the, the point was to try to figure out, you know, is there sufficient overlap with all these other policies and things that Council has approved? Uh, to see if, you know, in following through the intent on that, whether this would be a viable way to pursue those things. But, I mean, we, we could only make a recommendation at the end of the day. And our, to be clear, this is pretty far down the list in terms of our resource allocation as a commission. I mean, we're, we have a whole bunch of other things bearing in on uh, other council decisions like MX and Envision Eugene in particular. Thank you. <coughs> Councilor Zelenka. Yeah, I work with uh, Babe and, and Mr. Scove to uh, modify this language. The, it, the intent of encourage, let me give you an example, George, when uh, one of the issues is the health and safety is broken windows, uh, if, if, and that is in the current code to fix those. There is no linkage right now to get the, uh, when that window gets replaced, to put them in touch with the eWeb program that actually will put a double pane nice new window in there and eWeb would pay for it, part of it through energy efficiency related uh, benefits from it. So that synergy that could happen uh, is, is non-existent right now. So right now there's no synergy between the eWeb program that can help redo these things in a better way with energy efficiency in mind and help pay for it and that the landlord doesn't even 
get notified of that option. So that's the kind of thing that was that we were thinking about when it said encourage. So providing that information to the landlord could actually reduce their cost, but it could also increase energy efficiency. That, so that's the kind of thing we were talking about when we said encourage energy efficiency when addressing health and safety issues in rental housing programs. That's a specific one that we're talking about. There may be other ones that I haven't thought of, but that one's the, the real one. So to me, that's a very laudable thing to, to try to get those two programs aligned uh, to benefit renters and landlords, for that matter. The other change that we made to the, to the, to the language was in the last row, which was to articulate uh, uh, economic uh, used to say benefits, and we, uh, Councillor Clark suggested and we changed that to impacts, so that it, you know benefits and costs. So, so we just said, let's not make it really wordy. Let's just say impacts instead. So now all the those that whole row doesn't presume benefits, but it does talk about the economic impacts. So you look at both sides of every issue on that one. So that was then that <coughs> runs through that whole bottom column there. So that was the only other um, change that was made to the. To the, um, Councilor Taylor. Thank you. I, it's my intention to later suggest that we add energy efficiency to the housing code, and I've asked for an appointment with uh, Sarah to discuss just that. It is a, a part of it some places, but that's not what we're voting on tonight, and I don't want to alarm anyone, but I do want to push for that later. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I think we're ready to vote on this. Would you please vote? <clears throat> Seven in favor and one in opposition. It passes. And on to the next item. Thank you. So the last <laughs> action of item of the evening is an ordinance concerning the Human Rights Commission. City Manager. The Council is being asked to take action on an ordinance concerning changes to the Human Rights Commission Code. The proposed ordinance amends sections of the code and would update the Commission's structure and focus. No other changes to the Human Rights Code are affected by the proposed ordinance. <laughs> Go ahead. I move to approve Council Bill 5057 concerning the Human Rights Commission. Second. Moved and seconded. Councilor Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. So I just want to be real clear. I'm going to support the motion. I think it's a good, uh, it's good, you know, it's paring down the work and, and trying to make it more applicable to today's, um, to manage today's um, issues that we're working on. But I just want to make it real clear that um, in 2.013 around the appointment process that um, we still hold the cards basically and you were the expectation is I just want to make it real clear I'm going to support it but the expectation is that you guys are going to review them make some recommendations but we may very well pull from the pool of applicants that you all maybe you know didn't recommend so I just you know just wanted to make that real clear that's my opinion of that's my interpretation of that's what it says Okay, good. Thank you. And thank you guys for the hard work you do for the city. Councilor <laughs> Barr. Thank you, Mayor. I'm not sure quite where I stand on this one. <laughs> I'd, like, <laughs> I'd like to recognize the chair and the vice chair of the Human Rights Commission who are with us in the audience tonight, uh, Tony Gatsu, Ken Newbeck. Thank you very much for your hard work on this, and thank you, Raquel, for your work on this. As has been stated, this removes no responsibility or accountability from the council. It just helps us make our, make our work more significant. Thank you. It's kind of interesting that almost every topic we had tonight is sort of interrelated in terms of uh, the needs of low-income folks and the rights of everyone. It's all connected. Huh? It's all connected. It's all connected. Would you please vote? Eight in favor, none in opposition. It passes. And with that, we thank you all. We finish the business of the evening.